you. Hello and welcome everyone to episode 10 of System Soft Technologies LinkedIn Live Series, Ask an Expert. My name is Hank Lee and I'm a marketing manager here at System Soft Technologies. In today's episode, our experts will discuss and debate leveraging AI decision engines to accelerate RPA and also answer your questions, including why you needed decision engines and why now. So we welcome your questions during the event. And you can do that by putting your questions in the comment sections below. If we don't get to your question live, be assured that we will follow up with you on that same thread. Now, let's go ahead and introduce our experts. First, we have a special guest today, James Duez, co-founder and CEO for Rainbird. Welcome, James. Nice to see you. Yes, thank you for joining today, and we look forward to your insights. And as you're, as we're talking today, if you want to reach out to James and connect with James, you can scan the QR code, um, and we'll be also um, giving you some information about how to connect with our experts on LinkedIn. So thanks for joining today, James. Next, we have Thomas Helfrich, Vice President of Intelligent Automation for SystemSoft Technologies. Welcome, Thomas, and thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. On the show. Yes. And again, with Thomas, you can also scan the QR code and connect with Thomas off online or offline. So we really appreciate you guys being here today. And then, um, you know, as we said, use the links as we're getting as we're going through the event today. You can use those links and we'll and those guys will be able to connect with you on LinkedIn. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Thomas and James and let's get the conversation going. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. James Duez, Rainbird.ai. Thank you for joining today. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good, Thomas. How are you? I'm good. I love the red light accordion, the mix all together. It just frames the conversation for some cool <laughs> nerdy stuff that we're going to talk it's about. It's a great vibe. It's a great vibe. <laughs> it's a cool vibe. Um, so today, you know, and for any, you know, for the people watching, we, James and I have gone back and forth for a number of years on RPA and robotic process automation and intelligent automation and inference engines. And we, what we started to see is a trend, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame up where we're going to go and then kind of land us how we're going to get there, is we've seen a really great way to accelerate intelligent automation and robotic process automation, leveraging an AI decision services or AI inference engines. And we'll go through and to define all that, but we're going to end on how you can do this at scale to really accelerate any new or existing RPA uh, initiative. Uh, so as I had said, RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation. There's different parts to it. There's a lot of challenges, but maybe, and I think a lot more people would probably know what RPA is at this point, but maybe not what an AI inference engine is or an AI decision engine is. James, I'm going to give that to you. Can you can you maybe just kind of like lay, uh, lay the groundwork for uh, those technologies and what they are and maybe what they aren't? Yeah, so look, in, in simple terms, uh, an AI inference engine uh, is a technology that combines you know, business logic and data to automate complex decisions. So these are decisions that are beyond the scope of your traditional decision tree. So we're talking about looking at decisions in a non-linear way. Uh, Rainbird is an inference engine. It's capable of combining rules and data, actually in a very similar way to the way that we do in our own heads, it reasons. Uh, and it kind of infers new things and can make highly accurate, explainable decisions in really complex areas like tax and credit and fraud and healthcare. Typically, these are areas where there are regulators who really care about the rationale that sits behind those decisions. 
So, so everyone's on the same page. What would, how would you define by, or what do you mean by inference exactly? So inference is, uh, is kind of how we make decisions. If I, if you imagine, you know, nothing of the world, and I know in Thomas, in your, your case, it's very easy, but imagine, you know, nothing of the world. I'm going to give you two bits of information. The first is that Socrates is a man. The second is all men are mortal. Now, if I ask you to play back what you know of what I've just said, you would tell me Socrates is a man, but you would infer that Socrates is mortal. So we, we have this sort of whole repository of knowledge that we accumulate through our lives, our you know, formal education, our careers, the rules we do our jobs by. And when we're trying to make decisions, we're looking at data and we're kind of matching that data against what we know. Uh, and we're often deriving inferences. We, we're making judgments based on the combination of, of, of data and, and rules, really. And that's really what inference is. And because these technologies are able to uh, combine logic and data in a very similar way. They're very easy and quick to work with, uh, and they're also very powerful. They can make very nuanced probabilistic judgments that would be beyond most traditional rules engines to be able to do. So in that AI statement, first of all, is it artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, you know, accelerated intelligence? <laughs> what is it and where is it in, in your yeah. opinion? I know you love yeah. this conversation, but I think it's important to define what that is and if it is, I guess. So you, you and I have debated the term AI. I know lots in the past, and, and I'll be honest, the, the term AI is unhelpful uh, because AI means different things to different people. So it's a really good question. I mean, I think to just to, let's just focus on the AI piece for a minute. I, I mean, to take the simplest definition, most people would agree that AI is a machine doing a task that we thought required a human. Of course, the problem we all recognize is the moment AI succeeds, it no longer meets the definition. It reveals itself to be actually what it all, always was, just the next generation of computerization. So this so-called AI effect, uh, which has frankly been understood since the 1950s, you know, once it works, no one calls it a AI anymore. Uh, these technologies then get their own name. Uh, and this actually is what happened to RPA. I mean, I remember uh, being in Hong Kong, uh, presenting to a group of people uh, uh, quite some years ago now who, who all thought RPA, they considered RPA to be part of the AI landscape. And yet, actually, I just managed to catch the world where, where you know, in the, in, in the West, people no longer considered RPA to be part of AI, just as we wouldn't say now your sat-nav is AI or, you know, unique chess computers are, are, are AI. So I think we have to stop talking about the AI term uh, uh, because I think a lot of people confuse that with machine learning, which they kind of become interchangeable and we talk about computerization. So, I mean, for me, you know, an AI decisioning engine or an inference engine like this is an example of intelligent automation. Interesting. So, you know, I think it's important to note that I, you know, my idea of robotic process automation where it should live, specifically the point of view is, you know, it's there to accelerate humans and uh, and then change the nature of where work should go and the value proposition. So as you have really uh, democratized sets of, 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 of applications and, and really, you know, deterministic processes, those are really good for RPA. Um, and we'll get into why I think that whole, the the if thens and the decisions and the complexity that currently are getting built into RPA should be in these inference engines that are much more powerful. But I think it's really important to know uh, what not to confuse what we're talking about with an AI, sorry to use the term, but for the most part for right now, an, an advanced uh, inference engine versus that traditional rules engine. There's a, there's a fundamental difference between the two and specifically how they're applied. Um, in the intelligent automation world, and and you're the expert in this, so please kind of or drive us on that because that'll that'll drive the next conversation of why this accelerates RPA. Yeah, no, so I think that's a really good good way of looking at it. And actually, I think the landscape is broadly segmented into two kind of areas of technology. So if you imagine on the left hand side, you have everything that is kind of linear and rules based. So that's your decision trees. You would put RP, RPA in there, I guess, as well, where you've got technologies that are very good at doing simple linear uh, uh, tasks. They're not really uh, making complex uh, processes, they're making linear tasks. We all know that the, the, the rules engines get very unwieldy and complex very quickly, right? They take ages to code. Every time you add a new factor, you're exponentially increasing the complexity. They're very, very hard to maintain. And, 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 and actually, you know, these, uh, these technologies all rely on, on the technology side of the business. They, they rely on IT to you know you want to change something you've got to raise a ticket you've got to go and then wait for a whole software development life cycle to happen in order for there to be a change so you know we as organizations we're addicted to linear technologies because we think linearly it's very easy anybody can write down a process but we kind of got everything that's kind of linear rules engine on one side 
uh, uh, and we'll just park that there on the left. And then on the right hand side, lots of people's minds then go to, well, let's look at machine learning and data science and everything which is statistical. And, and of course, you know, uh, we can leverage data to inform future predictions. Um, but machine learning is not a natural automation technology. It's an, 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 an analysis technology. Um, machine learning models, we all know, are very difficult to build. They require copious amounts of clean data and you need time, money, and actually quite a lot of faith. Uh, and actually what you end up with may be predictive, but it's very difficult to interpret a rationale behind uh, 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 out, you know, what an algorithm that might say that's machine learning. If it could speak your language, uh, and it can't, but if you just say, why have you made that judgment? It's going to say, well, you wouldn't understand. It's a mathematical judgment, right? So so it makes predictions. It can't apply judgment. And, and I think so when we come to think about these decisioning engines and tools like Rainbird, they take the best of both worlds. So they have all that business accessible, um, very uh, structured, uh, powerful um, kind of aspects of a rules engine, but you, the ability to model uncertainty, to cope with missing data that, that's synonymous with machine learning. So you combine the best of both of these worlds to get all of their advantages, but actually manage to avoid all of their disadvantages and limitations. And they really sit between those two worlds. You know, a key thing I think you said there was, you know, in traditional uh, rules engines, if you will, or, or linear tape type of uh, decisioning, it's actually though creating the same effect that you'd have in RPA just differently. And so it, it doesn't really strip out the complexities of long process. So what I like though, is specifically, as you said, uh, if you take the business logic out and leave it at the business layer, so the, uh, the as logic needs to change or as the importance of the weighted of the decision itself changes, it lies in the business's hands in almost real time versus sitting uh, behind a JIRA wall of or a ServiceNow ticket to say, hey, can we update this? And they have a whole project plan. It's just, it's a change in the model immediately. And then what happens in, and I think this is where I'll tie RPA back in now is, if you could take the if-thens and the way that you need to decide things, even deterministically or subjectively, so you could tell RPA what to go do, you've just scaled RPA to a whole level of complexity and, and processes you could never have touched or built into RPA itself. And, and, and I yeah. think that's what you, you said, but by, <laughs> I think I'm trying to summarize that if we take the com, a more com, a, a simpler business friendly model that has higher ability to do complexity, but yet easier to maintain, you can therefore use more co complex processes and RPA together to really automate what maybe the original pitch of RPA would do. Yeah, and, and I think this is this is typical of some of the problems that you see with large, you said before, large RPA implementations. You know, they they, they become very difficult to scale because you've intrinsically tied up uh, process and, and decision logic. And if you remove business logic into a decisioning engine, and, and there's actually no point taking it from one linear uh, um, and, and, you know, RPA tool into a linear engine, right? You're just moving from one place to another. But if you move the business logic into... Uh, a, a no-code tool like Rainbow, you get yeah, you democratize the management of, of that logic. You you take that from being an IT function to being a business function. So there's huge advantages there. Um, but actually, what Rainbow does is rather than look at um, a decision tree, it's looking at a, a decision space, right? So you avoid all of the need to sort of raise IT tickets whenever you want to make changes. But because Rainbow is not linear, it can look at the whole RPA process at once. There's no decision tree, just this decision space. And if one part of the process, so you imagine, for example, you've got a long RPA process and one part of that process, let's say it's the fifth step, um, provides an answer that actually will, you know, in hindsight, render the rest of the process redundant, right? It happens to be that if you knew this fifth thing, you've gone off and scraped some data from some site, you've made a judgment, but actually if only it had known that first, it could have saved all that other effort going off trying to do other parts of that process. And of course, some of those tasks are expensive. They involve humans. Um, so you accelerate um, the build process, you accelerate the way that it runs so it's more efficient, but it's also ridiculously then becomes easy to maintain because every bit of RPA process is more reusable. The business logic is efficiently arranged, so you're not duplicating lots of logic in different versions of RPA processes. Uh, so you're effectively accelerating build time, and we've seen that accelerate 100x, right? I mean, seriously, taking weeks and weeks of work down to like an hour. Um, you're able to um, be more efficient in your consumption of RPA. It's it's much easier to maintain. And then actually you can make RPA relevant to 
a whole bunch of use cases that you you can't get to you know now rpa can't play in now because you're starting to think about making much more complex use cases with more complex reasoning yeah so you, you touched something very important there so scale uh, and, and you said it in a way that I, maybe it wasn't obvious though so the fact that you can touch way new areas so if you have a company's or organizations that are incredibly siloed for business reasons, for acquisition reasons, for PL, whatever the reason is, it's hard to scale RPA because you get fractional benefits typically if you don't have a core operational or shared service center to automate to. So the, the use cases of getting hundreds and thousands of people to be retooled or repurposed or new positions to be hired and the, the redundant ones to go uh, the way of the robot, if you will, becomes very difficult in those environments. But if you could take the decisions that are being made prior to the execution arm, which would be RPA or human in this matter, into a more centralized SaaS driven, you know, like all the all the trimmings of infrastructure and security and all the things you would need anyway, but you put into a centralized way, you just get scale operationally from day one. And you mentioned like, you know, and I've seen this as well, and uh, we've, we've seen this together as well, that we've seen, you know, hundreds of hours to go into something that can take minutes to build a, with a with the right technology, and then it it's it's maintainable from day one and without a, you know a person involved. It's with like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of an hour to keep that just up and running, and it's usually part of the service. So, if you could take that and and apply it to a new RPA implementation, I think you're you're golden from day one. I guess my question to you is, what do you think the lift is though? If I already have all this pre built. I mean, it, clearly there's a support benefit if you can move it to more of a decisioning services because you don't have to maintain, you know, a thousand uh, automations or 50 or 100. But what, what do you, how, you know, is it is it easy to, to move it once it's built? Does that actually speed you up? Or, do, you know, you talk to me about that because I think that'd be a pain point if I've already invested all this money in RPA. Yeah. How, how yeah, do you yeah. move it to decision services without it yet costing more money, I guess, like a ton more money? Yeah, so this is the you know is is the juice worth the squeeze kind of question, isn't it? Really? Yeah. So so if, if you're starting a new project, of course, you know we see these huge accelerations in in, in build cycle, um, you know run times many times faster, all the different benefits that we've described, and and you know ideally, of course, if you're starting a new project, you you want uh, a tool like Rainbow, uh, a decisioning engine, something that's non-linear to be the brain doing the orchestration because it's non-linear, it can look. Kind of holistically and it's almost omnipresent across these processes and you want rpa to do what rpa is great at which is being the fingers and the muscle to go off and do those process aspects of course if you've built lots of large rps processes rpa processes already and that's where you are nobody likes redoing stuff right but actually just separating the decision logic from the existing process can still make a huge difference to maintenance and speed yeah. uh you can't recover the build time because you built it but actually you can definitely get a huge amount back in the maintenance cost uh, you know, you can leave RPA effectively doing the orchestration, but then the RPA is deferring to Rainbow at each point to make the judgment. So then you've got all the logic still in one place where the business can manage that without that being an IT ticket, as we said. Uh, so you can still leverage many of the benefits and it's and it's still worth doing. And then, of course, ultimately, you get to a point where you have to refactor a process. And then that's the time where you might switch around where the orchestration sits. But uh, there's benefits to it, whether you're starting from scratch or you're trying to work with existing processes. The uh, <laughs> sell, not that this is a built for purpose conversation for you guys, sell, but but this is where you know, as I've you know been an intelligent automation expert for you know, or heading that way, I should say, I'm, I'm to your level, but that that we've started this conversation years ago about where this really should go, and it's it's not you know not to be a shameless plug just for for Rainbird's you know, Rainbird.ai that would be the shameless part, plug. but if <laughs> if um, but but honestly though what you've built is 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 built for purpose for intelligent automation and. The fact that it's already pre-integrated into the RPA tools as a click and drag decision services uh, really lends itself to be the intelligent automation decision services technology, specifically aligned to enable RPA, intelligent document processing. Uh, but you even put a feedback loop in so, that, so it can learn and, and better execute and better decide with transparency and explainability. And uh, I think just a moment or two to talk about that is so important because it's not like you do it, then you, you're still stuck with the same, there, like there's no incremental benefit over time that's actually pre-built into just the nature of the system. And I don't use the word AI, but like, you know, yeah. I know you no, have the word feedback loop, but, but the truth is it's learning, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 we, could, we could get into a big philosophical discussion about the nature of what learning is, but yeah, ultimately, you know, uh, it can discover new information about the world simply by being used. And, and, and that makes the entire process more and more efficient. Of course, that's kind of where the, 
the AI label comes from. And of course, you can also combine this kind of human likes. This, this is a systemization of human reasoning, right? You're taking what would almost always be an intrinsically human task and embedding that in, in a in a capability that can sit on top of RPA, it can sit on top of uh, um, even machine learning and, and, and data science and apply uh, human judgment in an entirely auditable way. Um, but you're right, you know, being being in the RPA ecosystem, having integrations with Prism, UiPath, et cetera, et cetera, sort of out of the box makes it very, very easy to, for, to adopt and use. You know, a lot of, um, if you actually look at a lot of the work that we've done historically over the last eight years, we're automating quite complex human reasoning in, in a whole bunch of different areas, which maybe we can right. talk about in a minute. But, 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 but quite a lot of organizations have not got to that stage. You know, it still feels a little bit, you know, if you're still doing the copy and paste and trying to automate the task stuff that's really dragging you down, you kind of need to get through that so that you can get to the higher value uh, tasks. And how do we use this technology to generate entirely new products and services that are AI powered that you just couldn't do any other way? How do we not just be more efficient, but deliver high quality customer experience and high quality outcomes? Um, and everybody wants to get there, but for some organizations trying to scale their RPA processes and get those effective, which is effectively, is it, it becomes a tactical problem they have to deal with, needs to be dealt with to get to the strategic. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, our ability to accelerate RPA the, and, and, and simply, you know, I'll be honest with you, even, even if you're not using Rainbow, separate business logic from process, it's a better design pattern that gives you efficiency gains. Yeah. Um, getting through that then enables you to get to these higher levels of truly intelligent automation, which just sit as the next layer, the next generation of that capability. That's an issue. So it, it's always been, uh, <laughs> whenever I've done any consulting or in, in been doing an assessment in the IA space for the last several years, it's always that design architecturally that I've recommended that you pull decisioning and logic specifically out of how you design any intelligent automation system, because if it wasn't three years ago, it wasn't available, but there was technology coming that's going to take that space because that's more complex than doing. And specifically the RPA is very good at doing things. It just takes a lot more lift and people and time to make them think a bit. So keep them dumb, keep them executing, move all that piece out. I actually like the fact that you could take from, so if I think about how inference goes, it goes across, um, a whole universe of, of logic and data and decisions. So you can take what you've learned from transactional processes and be able to apply that to a better business model itself. And you could take the data that's learned from a sales side and say, here'd be a better way to process this. And then those two are related now from an operational arm and from a revenue arm. And, and that creates the additional efficiency once you start tying in more pieces because that's that the decision services can look at holistically in a way that you could never do because you just don't have insight. And that that really transforms at an incredible scale, speed, a, a digital transformation program that's like stuck where like, where else can we do, right? I think you start looking at ways you tie pieces together that otherwise could never have been tied. And yeah. specifically, if you've never even, if you've used like, we don't even touch RPA in certain areas because it's just too complex, good. This is where you would start. And then you, <laughs> so I would say yeah. that's where you start and you back out now to like, oh, okay, what can we execute from the decisions and now we have the complexity under control. And so I, I, I think my original thought that accelerating RPA, I, I'm wrong. It's actually just accelerating digital transformation and, oh, yeah, and uh, extrapolated to much larger sets. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's the, the great thing about working with intelligent software like this is it becomes a stakeholder in the whole change management process, so in the whole evolution. So it's just in a very simple way, you know, we've seen people build tools that are identifying fraud and financial crime, onboarding clients into financial services, going through the whole, you know, your client anti money laundering compliance stuff, you know, underwriting claims. The, the list is endless. But actually, um, what we see is that when, um, you know, you, let's say you build an underwriting engine uh, and, and you see those incremental improvements or you, you let's say you, you make a conscious decision to go and improve that engine, you can ask the technology. You couldn't just silently rerun those last hundred thousand claim, you know, uh, policies we underwrote, and go, you know, tell me how you would have done that differently had I told you this new thing back then, um, and actually use it to be an, a, a, a co-architect of the way that the business evolves. Everybody wants to be more efficient, right? They want to get better customer experience and outcomes, and they want to go find new revenues. They are the three universal truths of every organization. Except the United um, States Post Office. I'm sorry. Well, I make no judgment about your post office. I think oh, there is anything like our post office. I suspect that's absolutely correct. But actually, you know, the, 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 the democratization of these technologies, making sure that business logic is a business function and that IT stuff is an IT function, 
accelerating this change process, things like automated testing, all of these tools that come built in uh, enable you to have uh, utter faith in what you're doing. And I suppose that's really a key point to make. This technology is explainable. You know, we are right not to trust technologies that can't explain themselves, right? We're right to be cynical about why some black box algorithm has made a particular judgment. It's really key that we can understand the rationale that sits behind automated decisions, where those automated decisions have an impact on people's lives, right? So financial services, healthcare, these are areas where it matters. And if the computer, uh, you know, is giving a, a, a judgment, it needs to be able to articulate the why. And increasingly, regulators are going to ensure that that's the case. So you need explainable technologies that can leverage the best of the human side as well as data science and combine yeah. these together. This is how we get to these new, these new powerful use cases and products. If you're in an audit rich environment, I would say if you can have every file audited through explainability, you're way ahead of any human could do. That's for sure. That's that's one part that yeah. I believe yeah. can be there. People, I, I, you, I think you got a question in the uh, comments. Do you want to uh, you want to tackle that one, Jane? So which one is that? Sorry. Uh, so. I'm just trying to look read. How Intelligent does automation, incorporate? yeah. How does Rainboard incorporate process specific metadata into the decision making process? Is that part of the person enabling the AI system to learn? Yeah, so that's a that's a very detailed question. Um, we should so, hire that guy. Get <laughs> that guy, get yeah. that guy signed up. I want him. You can't have him. Yeah. So no, I mean, effectively, you know, when you're building these models, um, you're building models in Rainbird. It's a conscious modeling process in technical terms. What you're building is we call a knowledge map, but they're they're effectively probabilistic graphs. And and, and what you're doing is you're building a, 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 a model that describes your business domain. And rather than trying to string logic together, you are encoding logic onto a map. Now, if you imagine, you know, I could give you instructions how to walk from where you are now to your nearest train station, and 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 and, and they're fine unless there's a road closed or you want a coffee on the way. We don't navigate using linear steps. We use a map, and that's the analogy that I would relate to Rainbow. So we can encode tremendous amounts of knowledge uh, into these knowledge maps. And then when you query that knowledge map, it is able to replay the, that, that logic with all of that metadata back to you as part of the rationale. So you know you can literally, instead of asking the human the question, you can ask a rainbow powered tool the question and it will, it will reason like you would reason. It will go off and pull data from different places, including RPA or machine learning or whatever else is necessary. And it will play back to you your uh, it, its answer, its certainty, um, how it could have got to a better judgment if only it knew more. Uh, if it doesn't have enough data, it can construct a, a conversation to get that data from you and using a chat interface. And then it can play back uh, that with any of the metadata you've associated with what's important. So, you know, long story short, you want to onboard somebody. Um, that process can be automated. If there's not enough data, it becomes semi-automated and it brings a human in the loop. And what you might end up with is a three-page PDF report that explains in plain English why this individual could or could not meet that particular standard with all the metadata that comes with that. I'm not sure if that answers the gentleman's question, but that's the, probably the best answer I can pull out now. I honestly think you're going to need a data scientist for this. You want to uh, dispel that myth? You definitely don't need a data scientist to do this. You don't even need data to do this, right? You can take the big challenge with, with building sort of what would used to be called expert system technology is the knowledge elicitation process and handling probabilities and uncertainties. We all know as, as, as experts in our own field, we know a lot about our domain, right? We are able to encode. Anybody can build these, these tools in Rainbow. It's, it's no code. You don't even have to be a, a software engineer. You can build these tools. And if you don't have data, you can simply build tools that work off knowledge. It's any combination of knowledge and data. And you certainly don't need to be a data scientist. All right, shameless plug time. How do people try this, Mr. Duez? So we actually have a free. We we, we very you know we we share our technology in, in the community because we want people to come and play with it. So anybody can go to uh, community.rainbird.ai and they can sign up and they can get access to the full stack of the technology and a community portal where they can see lots of sort of case studies and examples and talk to our team. Um, uh, so that's the easiest way to get your hands on the technology. You just you just sign up and you can go ahead and use it. Just go to automate, uh, sorry, to community.rainbird.ai. And once you get past that as like a company, I mean, really, like, what's the reality from proof of concept to value? Yeah. So typically, uh, that's that's kind of anywhere between a six and twelve week process. Uh, but we've actually built tools in a day, right? So when COVID struck. 
our, our National Health Service approached us and said, can we, we need to risk assess like 2 million people, right, to identify the risk of them being harmed by COVID on the front line. And in three two-hour sessions, we built a model that almost certainly saved lives. It went from being an idea to being in production in eight days. And five of those was the health service putting it through a, a clinical safety uh, process. So you can build these models very quickly. Um, the time consuming piece is being very clear about what it is you want to achieve, not actually using the tool. Using the tool is, in, is, is incredibly quick. Well, that's amazing. You know, um, I don't know if we have any more questions out there. James, do you have any questions for me? So, I man, I think the question I have for you is, you know, we, we, we've talked a bit about this and, and you have a, a lot of exposure to RPA over many, many years. What's your take on the biggest challenges that organizations are facing right now? Um, you know, I'm, 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 how do you think this 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 plays out with this this new category of technology? Is there anything we haven't covered that, that you want to highlight for everyone? Yeah, uh, for me, I think understanding that the biggest challenge is that where the overselling of RPA itself is what it could do. Um, by itself, it couldn't do that. And so there's a scramble of, of you know, companies are valued at incredible levels. So they're trying to scramble to make that value be real. And the, re the reality is it's gone from RPA to intelligent automation for a, for a reason or hyper automation, whatever the latest term is. But it's more than RPA because it's clearly needed. And a human is still needed in the loop to improve these systems. The technologies aren't there to, to make it completely autonomous. You need technologies that do, like an RPA. You need some that have a capability specific, like an intelligent document processing and you know the things that go around that. And then you need things that think and, and you need you need it beyond the typical you know if then rules engines for sure. So, in, as I look at other companies, if if they've if they want to get more out of intelligent automation, you need to leverage additional technologies as they come up correctly. This happens to be one of them that I would recommend as an expert uh, and have recommended. And I say if you're just starting or you thought maybe it was too expensive or too hard to get going, there's probably a different way to start and looking at it uh, because if you can help automate the decisioning, that's sometimes the hardest step to get your head around. And once you have the decisions automated and you're comfortable with that, then you can easily make it go do things because you're now comfortable with what it's doing. So I, that's what I love about this is that it sits on the business side. So the business can see, yeah, that would be the decision I would have made, or I understand why it made that decision and I agree with it, or I don't, and then we, can, we can change the model. But once you get to there, who wants to go do anything? You want to let something else go do it for you that's pretty repetitive. So I, I think that's the shift that I'll see moving forward is leveraging more and more of these smarter types of technologies to extrapolate the hard parts that RPA right now shouldn't do, but it's probably, it's been embedded to do. Yeah. I think it's, I think actually, you know, as te technologists, we have an obligation to share everything that we can about how to make things move faster and be easier. I know that we're all here to talk and represent our businesses and the technologies that we have, but you're right. This is one of a spectrum of technologies that, that string together. No, very few solutions are delivered out of just one, one piece of kit. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we've actually got an event coming up on the 7th of um, December where we're just going to share absolutely everything we know about how to accelerate RPA from awesome. all the different experiences that we had. Um, if anybody's interested in, in signing up for that, they can just go to rainbow.ai. There's a link there and, and they can just come along. It's a free training event. It's not a sales event. It's actually, we're just putting together uh, expertise to try and show everything we can about how to get more out of the whole spectrum of technologies that people already have. I will I will definitely attend and heckle that. I'm sure, you, no will. I'm sure you will. I, will. I will throw things at it. Anyway, uh, but guys, thank, it, it, James, so much, and the team at Systems Software for putting this on. Anyone who's uh, you know joined or is watching this at a later time, this is a uh, it's a great first step, and I look forward to following up with you with some more success stories on the topic, and and even more data points. If anybody obviously wants to have some more specifics around where this is applied and where we've applied it, just reach out to these QR codes or uh, or just reach out directly to either you or myself and happy to continue the conversation. Thank you, James, oh, and have a great yeah, evening. Thank you, you thank you very much. Just say yes in the chat. We'll come talk to you. And it's, it's great to be here. Yes in the chat. I want more. And, uh, back yeah, to you, great, great to be here. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for inviting thank you. me. It's been fun. Hank, you might be on mute. And if you are, oh boy. Can't use the eight. <laughs> hey, eight, I just want to, I just want to thank you guys once again. And, um, if I could, I'd like to share my screen about the event that you mentioned, James. So we'd like to share that with everybody here. Just yeah. give our, our production team a second to pull that up before we close out today. So thank you guys it. for a great conversation. 
looks like we're having a little technical difficulty pulling that up, but um, here we go. So here's the event that James mentioned. If you guys want to sign up for that, it's coming up um, in a week or so. And um, James, you might want to mention a little bit more about that event for us. Thanks, if you could. Yeah, so it's on the 7th of December. It's titled How to Scale RPA Faster, actually by separating uh, process and business logic. Uh, so you can just go to rainbow.ai, you can sign up. And the, the idea is that by the end of this that you can learn how to build and execute your RPA processes faster, ensure that every single digital worker is, is working efficiently, um, uh, you know, uh, create a structure whereby business people have more control over the business logic so that change is easier to manage. And actually, you can start moving on to use cases that, frankly, RPA alone are impossible to tackle. So you just fill in the... The form there, it's on the 7th of December. Uh, the event's going to be repeated. We're going to run this on a rolling basis. But as I said, it's, it, we're not there to sell you anything. We're just there to share everything that we know and that we've come across with all of our various different partners, uh, and um, including um, um, Systemsofts and, and, and others, and just share that with the community. Well, that's really awesome. We, we just want to thank you guys once again for the insightful conversation today. As a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions for Thomas or James, you can definitely reach out and connect with them on LinkedIn. You can also add comments in the event uh, comment section. We're happy to, to connect with you there. And again, we want to thank our experts again today. James, really appreciate you coming on as our special guest and all your uh, expert insights. And Thomas, as usual, we appreciate your help too. And, you know, maybe... Um, you know, go up and talk to the folks that are running the vacuum cleaner in the background. <laughs> you know, I know what you're talking about. I didn't hear anything. I, I, I don't know. It must have been on your end, Hank. Yeah, it must have been on my end. Okay, well, thank hey, you. I'm, I'm here for you, but more importantly, I'm here for James. Yeah. Cheers. Well, so, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. It's really enjoyed it, and it's, uh, it's a great yes. topic to talk about. So thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.